Okay. Baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost, John's testimony. Um, disclaimer, it's very early here. The sun is not up yet. <laughs> and my house is quiet, so... Uh, excuse my croaky voice and the roosters crying and, and everything else. Um, okay. There's been a lot written about the baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost. So as an example and by way of testimony, here is my description of my baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost. I say the word my, not out of vanity, but to em emphasize the fact that while there are general things which must happen, each person will experience it differently, making the experience uniquely yours. This ordinance is performed by God personally and he takes extra care to make it unique and memorable i also tend to shy away from bearing my testimony not because i'm afraid or ashamed i'm happy to bear my testimony at all times and at all places but there is a tendency for people to think when they hear something like this that the person is tacitly claiming authority over a person by touting their spiritual experiences and callings in my case nothing could be further from the truth as one who has received this baptism, I have covenanted be, to be a witness for God at all times and at all places. To be silent would be to deny my testimony and also the Holy Ghost, which I will not do. I am also hesitant to tell everything that happened, but the Lord wants me to tell it all. So this is going to be long <laughs> and my voice may give way. Many times we set up stakes. We paint the Lord into a corner and actually try and dictate to him what he can and cannot do. But when we have faith in the Lord, he can show us that he specializes in doing what they say can't be done. I was born into an inactive part member family in the church. I was raised in a tiny branch. I studied the gospel on my own and became converted to the gospel by reading the scriptures and books by early church leaders. After we moved into a ward, I used to walk up to the bishop's house and read all of his books. I remember this particular quote that really impressed me. We consider that God has created man with a mind capable of instruction and a faculty which may be enlarged in proportion to the heed and diligence given to the light communicated from heaven to the intellect and that the nearer man approaches perfection, the clearer are his views and the greater his enjoyments till he has overcome the evils of this life and lost every desire for sin and like the ancients arrived at that point of faith where he is wrapped in the power and the glory of his maker and is caught up to dwell with him. History of the Church. I met a few people in the church who actually believed things like that and talked about it, but they were usually on the fringes of the church and not in the mainstream at all. But I wanted to know more. I was never a big leader in the church. I'm not comfortable telling people what to do. I prefer in giving people their freedom and trusting them to do the right thing. I served a mission, got an MBA from BYU, married in the temple, had four children but I was constantly searching for more. I had qu questions that the church couldn't answer. Answer. We'll get straight to it. My timeline, 1982, excommunicated from the church. I thereafter covenanted with the Lord that I was going to make it back when I was excommunicated from the church. The stake president told me at my trial that I was no longer under covenant to the church and this would make it easier to repent. What a sense of relief when I heard this. I was determined to somehow make it back, though at the time I didn't exactly know what that meant. I know now that it meant that I was going to make it back to the Lord. Uh, 1982, baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost. I was told at this. I was told this at the time, and later prayed to confirm it. I didn't learn until recently about the condemnation that the church was under. According to some, the baptism of fire and Holy Ghost was therefore no longer available to church members until the keys were returned to the earth so as to continue this work. If this is true, then by being excommunicated back in 1982, I was no longer under covenant to the church and no longer under the condemnation of the church and was able to deal directly with the Lord as a free agent. April 1985, I covenanted with the Lord to de dedicate my life to him and serve him. Also April 85, Another baptism of fire, followed by many revelations and spiritual experiences over the years. I was getting closer to the Lord, but I didn't know exactly where I was on the path or where I stood with him. I had a great relationship with the Lord, but I never knew there was so much more. Why didn't the Lord tell me more, you might ask? I didn't know enough to think to ask. 
I eventually learned my lesson. Ask, ask, ask. May 1987. While on a hike in the mountains, the Lord whispered to me that I had eternal life. July 2019. I've been a believer in the doctrine of Christ before. But after I read Conversing with the Lord Through the Veil by Denver Snuffer, I was convinced to fully embrace the everlasting covenant and to seek revelation, receive it, and act on it. Okay, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord's reply, talk to me. I began praying constantly to the Lord, covenanting to obey him and only him, um, and reading the experiences of those who were seeking or had experienced the second comforter. Since doing so, I have noticed an incredible change in my personality, and the way I approach life. Repentance, prayer, overcoming temptation, practicing charity, gifts of the Spirit, faith, communion with God, all changed from being impossible to being actually doable. I've grown to know the Lord better than ever before in my life. Uh, February 11th, 2020. I recorded the events of this day in my journal as they happened not understanding that they were all leading up to my baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost. I was kneeling in prayer, asking the Lord to help me come to him. I felt a presence in the room and looked over, and kneeling next to me was the Lord. Instead of me coming to him, he came to me. He comes to meet you where you are. Yes, he does. We prayed again together for a while. Then he took a step or two away and prayed to the Father for me. I felt what the people in the Book of Mormon must have felt when they saw Jesus praying to the Father for them. And no tongue can speak, neither can they be written by any man, and neither can the hearts of men conceive so great and marvellous things as we both saw and heard Jesus speak. And no one can conceive of the joy which filled our souls at the time we heard him pray for us unto the Father. Of all the events in this write-up, this is the one that moves me the most, to think that the Lord would take the time to come and get down in the trenches and condescend to kneel and pray with me and then pray to the Father for me. All the gratitude I could express would not begin to do this justice. I want to pay him back. I want to express my thanks, but I am totally incapable of doing so. February 11th, 2020. At some point during this meditation, the Father and Son came, laid their hands on me and ordained me. The Father on my right, the Son on my left. I will need to ponder the significance of what happened and just what I did receive. The Spirit bore witness that they were there, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Now it is up to me to ponder what I received. I venture to say that in the entries that follow, the effects will have become evident. I realize later that part of the baptism of fire of Holy Ghost is where the Savior pleads your case to the Father, that he may adopt you as his son or daughter, and they were also beginning to administer the baptism of fire, Holy Ghost. And they, and they were ordaining me or blessing me prior to my baptism of fire and Holy Ghost. I didn't get any of the words they were saying, but I know that the, at the proper time, what they said will be revealed to me. I didn't know if this experience was supposed to continue or not, but for some reason the experience ended. I look back and think that the reason why it did not continue was because I had not explicitly asked for a baptism of fire or Holy Ghost, having supposed that I had received it back in 1985. You have to specifically ask for what you desire. You have to express your faith. This whole experience up till now, and what I am about to to describe, seemed to me to be completely natural, relaxed, and not dramatic in the least. February 25th, 2020. I visited with... Edit. Well, let's give him a name. We'll just call him Peter. I visited with Peter, his wife, and another family who just returned from a mission in Africa. Peter, who had had a, who had had experiences with the Savior many times, explained to me that the Lord had called him to be an apostle to the nations. He held the apostolic order of the Melchizedek priesthood, and told me of the many times that the Lord directed him to people who were prepared, and he gave them their baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost, but had never received it himself. I asked why not. The Lord could send some heavenly messenger to do it. He told me he was waiting for some mortal person to administer it to him, then the Lord would seal it. 
I know that I have this same authority because the Lord told me so seven, several months ago. And at this point in our conversation, I felt the prompting that someday I would be the person to administer this ordinance to him. He told me that the Lord led his family to Texas because there were people here that ne he needed to meet. Was I one of them? Peter told me how they taught the African people and administered to them the baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost. He said it was all based on 3 Nephi 11. He also said that I needed to pray to the Father and ask him a couple of questions. I was determined to do this anyway. I wanted to study 3 Nephi 11 and gain, really gain a testimony of it. But what really amazed me is how could Peter know that his advice to me was exactly the next step I should take. I believe it was inspiration, which he was entitled to receive by virtue of his apostolic calling. I didn't realize that at the time, but all the details are now starting to come together for me. He didn't offer to perform the ordinance on me because he probably knew through the spirit that the ordinance had commenced, uh, commenced already under the direction of the Lord and needed to be brought to completion. Time and pondering over these experiences have shown me that the hand of the Lord is in every detail. Everything that happened was done as a witness to him, and he has asked me to record it so I could bring this witness to you. February 29th, 2020. This should be an easy day to remember. This was the day it happened. Peter taught me the simple message that he taught the people. It was all of 3 Nephi 11. <laughs> he said that heaven works by certain fixed laws, and when you follow the, follow the laws, you get the result. When I got home, I was excited to try what he had told me. I set aside a block of time the next morning, I read 3rd Nephi 11 twice, praying to understand it and receive a testimony of it. Nothing happened after either reading. I didn't give up. The Lord then instructed me to read or listen to 3rd Nephi 11 again. This would be the third time I'd read it that day, so I downloaded an audio and listened to it. While listening, I was finally impressed by the Spirit. This was kind of like when Christ appeared to the Nephites. The people needed to hear the voice of God three times in order for it to penetrate their ears, their eyes and their hearts. Listening to the audio, I visualized myself among the people gathered at Bountiful. <clears throat> I saw the presence of the Lord and visualized in my mind what it would be like to be called up by him and witness the marks in his body. As I did so, the Lord called me up. I knelt at his feet and witnessed him. Then he asked me to stand, looked straight into my face and gave me a calling. He told me that I was called with the same calling as Nephi. I really hesitate to include this, but the whole rest of the experience that day was conducted by the Lord as if I were Nephi. I feel like I need to include this reference, but I hesitated to do so because I don't want people to think I was making myself special. This is fear of man on my part. I just want people to know the, this whole experience is possible, not special. And the Lord is in every detail. I also know that when I don't hold back or hesitate, but tell the whole story, the Spirit really affirms that to me. The Lord wants me to be bold and hold back only when he tells me to. We need to develop super faith to trust the Lord in describing things like this and in exercising faith in all things. This was in vision, but I also felt the presence of the Lord in the room. When I opened my eyes, I could see him appearing before me in glory. So this wasn't just a vision, but this was the glory of the Lord I had previously known and experienced. He came right into the room, appeared as a being of light, but the light was very faint, probably a reflection of my present spiritual condition and what I am able to bear. I need to understand more. Uh, after listening to the MP3 of 3rd Nephi 11, where the Lord first appeared at Bountiful, I was impressed to pray to the Father. I got right to the point, approached him as a little child who was lost. I told him that I was supposed to ask him a question, but I didn't know what questions to ask. And I asked the father to tell me what I should ask for. But upon asking that question, immediately I knew what to ask for, and I had no doubt that the Lord would honor my request. I said, all I know what to ask for besides seeing you and knowing you as you are, is to ask for the baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost which I thought I had received years ago. But Peter had said there was no, another one that was even more powerful. And Christ said in that chapter of the Book of Mormon to pray to the Father and ask him for this gift. This was the turning point in this whole experience for me. 
when I requested this experience. You might think I am blindly following the arm of flesh by listening to this man, but I received a strong witness of the truth of everything he told me to do. The witness was so strong it was overpowering. If the Lord led him especially to come to Texas to meet me, I'm going to listen. All I can say is he inspired me to have exceeding faith. After the prayer, the father then just said, Go sit quietly and receive. I went over, sat down in a chair, closed my eyes, bowed my head. And immediately, without doing another thing on my part, and having no expectations whatsoever, I felt the spirit and this light descend over me like a blanket of fire. From head to foot, it pressed upon me. It didn't seem to burn me like last time, but it was intense. It was a vibration that filled me with joy, wave upon wave, faster and faster, closer and closer, <clears throat> until one wave blended with the next. It was high level vibration, the highest I've ever felt in my life. I just went with the flow. It shook me. I didn't know if I could stand up. It pressed in on me and weighed down on me in the chair. I could sense the fire surrounding me. I opened my eyes once and saw a light surrounding me brighter than usual, not just around my immediate body, but three feet all around me. I also saw two beings of light, the father and the son, faintly in their glory standing off to the edge of the circle of fire. There are a lot of other people in the room, the father and the son, and a whole host of other people were there. I take them to be members of the church of the firstborn. They didn't say anything, but I got the impression that they were trying to recruit me and welcome me into their company. Uh, 3 Nephi 11.35 Verily, verily, I say unto you that this is my doctrine, and I bear record of it from the Father, and whoso believeth in me, believeth in the Father also. And unto him will the Father bear record of me, for he will visit him with fire and with the Holy Ghost. This is exactly what happened. At one point I heard a voice saying, This is a new beginning for you, John. From now on, things will be different. I just sat there and kept singing hymns of, hymns of praise over and over in my mind. Come, our, come, O thou King of kings, we've waited long for thee, with healing in thy wings to set thy people free. Come make an end to sin and cleanse the earth by fire, and righteousness bring in the saints may tune the lyre. With songs of joy, a happier strain to welcome in the, thy peaceful reign. Glory to God on high. Let heaven and earth reply. Praise ye his name. I waited for the whole experience to complete. I would estimate it lasted about 15 minutes. Then another voice said, go and see your witness. I knew that meant to go look in the bathroom mirror. I saw my, my my aura, glory, halo, light, whatever you want to call it, still surrounding my body. But it was bigger and brighter than usual. In fact, it had been growing larger since my meeting with Peter. It was twice as large as the last time I looked. The Lord told me a couple of months ago, said he was going to put up a little mini baptism of fire to surround me 24-7. And I also noticed there was a little umbilical cord coming out of the crown of my head, reaching up to heaven. You could say it was a tongue of fire. The Lord said that this was a witness to me. Today as I write this, the faith that I have had all my life is turning into knowledge. And he is introducing me little by little to what it is like to receive knowledge as a fruit of faith. Compared to knowledge, faith is a nice, safe little corner you can hide in. You can say to yourself, the Lord will come through someday. I can wait. But with knowledge, you have to act now. You have no excuses. I think this is why we've had the redo. I think this is why we have this. Is what, sorry. I think this is why we had the redo on the baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost. So I would be sure. The last time was 40 years ago. I'm sure I needed my sins purged again. But this was the most real thing I've ever experienced. I have no doubt that it was true and was the baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost. It was time to receive some knowledge. People like to think the Lord wants to keep them in the dark. Actually, it's the other way around. The Lord wants to shower you with knowledge as fast as you're able to receive it. The tricky part is getting you and me ready to receive it. That's where faith comes in. He gives you experiences to build your faith. This isn't some cat and mouse game where he messes with your mind. Everything the Lord does, he does for our benefit. Looking back on this, this was the most real spiritual thing I've ever experienced. 
if I wanted, I could find a way to rationalize everything else, but not this. This was far beyond doubt. Usually when I have a spiritual experience, Satan comes around trying to get me to doubt. But he never came then and never has come back since. He can't. There's no room for doubt. I can't imagine ever being placed in a situation where I would be tempted to deny this. I would be sinning against so much light and knowledge. Then over the next few days, and occasionally again, I hear a voice saying to me, never doubt that you have been redeemed. After this experience ended, I prayed right then for a confirmation. And I asked the Lord if he didn't mind that I prayed a couple of times throughout the day for a confirmation. He told me he would confirm this to me. But first, he wanted me to record all of what happened in my journal. Asking the Lord is not doubt. The Lord is eager and anxious to prove all things to you, if you have a willing heart and an open mind. Uh, I wrote everything down, then a couple of hours later, out of my daily walk, I received my confirmation, not only of the baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost, but an understanding of the importance of the combined witness of Father and Son and the Holy Ghost which was with me and an overall increase of an intelligence. And he has confirmed this for me again and again. And the best form of confirmation is to pour down even more intelligence and insight and help me truly understand what I received and how it fits into the path I'm trying to follow. I have nothing but praise, admiration and awe. Like John Pontius used to say, the gospel is not only true, it works. It worked for Enoch the ancient apostles, Nephi or Joseph Smith, it will work for you and me. I also feel a greater sense of connection than ever before. The son, the father, the mother, to be part of their shared mind, the Holy Spirit. I prayed and thanked father for the opportunity to see him and mother again. When I mentioned mother, I really felt the spirit strongly. He loves her more than we can comprehend, but there are others too. There is truly a shared mind with them and with all who are part of the church of, first, of the firstborn. This experience isn't exclusively, exclusively for me. This is meant for everybody. Christ wants everybody to come to him and experience his love for them. When things like this happen to you, you don't want to keep them to yourself. You want to share them. You don't want to set yourself up and proclaim your authority over others. You want to be the Lord's servant and bring others to him. But by the same token, you will no longer be satisfied with a man standing between you and God. As much as I admire Joseph Smith and the ancient 12 for what they did and for their relationship with the Lord, the same relationship is available to us today. I've prayed to be able, with that other John, to bear this witness of myself. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son Jesus Christ. Nobody can bear a testimony that Jesus is the Christ, save he be meek, contrite, and obey God's ordinances. What are those ordinances? It is the three baptisms, water, fire, and the Holy Ghost. In his holy name, amen. Awesome. Thanks, John.